The interproximal, or bite wing, examination is used to reveal interproximal, occlusal, and secondary caries in posterior teeth, and also to provide an accurate picture of the alveolar crests. Success in revealing interproximal caries depends upon proper horizontal angulation. Directing the beam improperly will cause overlapping of adjacent surfaces and will obscure evidence of interproximal caries. The following procedure will provide excellent results. The patient is seated in the chair and the headrest adjusted. As in all dental radiographic techniques, the patient is asked to remove eyeglasses and in the case of a woman, her lipstick. Any removable dental appliances should likewise be removed at this time. The oral cavity should then be examined for any obstacles to the placement of film and the number, placement, and alignment of teeth. In this case, the patient has a full complement of teeth quite well aligned, but the lingual aspect of the maxillary ridge is quite prominent, and this could provide an obstacle to proper film positioning. In another patient, a hard mass of the palate is noted. This is a torus palatinus, a benign bony growth that may also interfere with proper film positioning. The film would have to be placed on one side or the other when radiographing the patient's teeth. Also note that the patient is lacking the maxillary left first molar and both third molars. In the lower jaw of another individual, a third example of an obstacle is noted. This is also a benign bony growth. It is not uncommon, usually occurs on both sides, and is called a torus mandibularis. The film must be placed on the lingual side of the torus when radiographing the patient's teeth. Care must be taken not to bruise the growth. In yet another case, we note that the lower second bicuspids are displaced lingually. This situation will require special methods to successfully radiograph the interproximal contact areas. These special methods will be explained in due course. Now, however, we will proceed with our standard procedure. The patient's head must be positioned so that the mid-sagittal plane is vertical. In a profile view, the line from the ala of the nose to the tragus of the ear should be horizontal. The occlusal plane of the teeth will then also be horizontal. The line of sight is a distinct aid in directing the X-ray beam. If the examiner positions his eye at a location that permits him to see through the interproximal spaces of the posterior teeth, and then directs the X-ray beam in the same direction, no overlapping of proximal surfaces should occur in uncomplicated cases. Both upper and lower segments should be visualized, of course. A guide for determining this proper direction is illustrated on this model. The direction of a line passing through the red marks on the tips of both cusps of the second bicuspid will be optimal for seeing through most of the interproximal areas. The contact area between the first and second molars has a different orientation, however, paralleling a line through the distal cusps of the first molar. In the mandibular segment, the upper bicuspid tip guide is generally suitable for all interproximal areas, except the first bicuspid cuspid contact. Returning now to our procedure, the vertical angulation of the X-ray head is set at eight degrees downward. Our patient has remained in her proper position, and we move the X-ray head into an elevated temporary position to allow proper horizontal alignment of the X-ray cone. The central X-ray beam should be directed through the interproximal space between the upper second bicuspid and molar and aligned parallel to the cusp tip line of the bicuspid. We are now ready to insert the film. The number three packet is generally acceptable. Since the packet is flat, the corners may be uncomfortable to the patient and should be rolled back. This must be done carefully to avoid creasing the film. With the tab side up, 
The packet may also be rolled lengthwise over a finger to further facilitate patient comfort. Proper insertion and positioning of the film is all important, so we use models to demonstrate. As the patient opens, the film is introduced horizontally and rotated into position. The packet is positioned with its anterior edge aligned with the center of the cuspid. To do this, it is necessary to position the anterior edge of the packet lingual to the mandibular central incisor. The position is illustrated on this model. Note that there is considerable space between the bicuspids and the correctly placed film packet. With the film properly positioned, the patient is asked to slowly close. The examiner maintains the position of the packet with his index finger, carefully sliding it out of the way at the last possible moment. The packet position has been maintained, and the film would now be ready for exposure. We now view the same procedure from behind the models. The horizontal insertion, rotation into position, maintenance of position during slow closure, and now ready for exposure. Removal of the film is merely a reversal of the procedure. Utilizing the same principles, the film packet is now inserted into the mouth of the patient. With the film packet properly positioned, the previously aligned x-ray cone is lowered, or the chair and the patient are raised to a position where the center of the beam is directed at the occlusal surfaces of the teeth. Lips are closed, and the exposure is quickly taken, and the film packet removed. Note that the end of the bite tab has remained parallel to the long axis of the film. This excellent interproximal radiograph illustrates a number of features that are desirable in a successful bite wing film. First of all, the occlusal plane of the teeth virtually splits the middle of the radiograph horizontally, providing adequate coverage of both upper and lower teeth. The maxillary contacts are open, giving excellent views of all proximal surfaces. The extent and character of the interceptal alveolar bone is also well displayed. All of the mandibular contacts are open, except between the cuspid and first bicuspid, where there is distinct overlapping. A supplementary film would be necessary to properly display that interproximal area. The remainder of our presentation will, in fact, demonstrate some of the problem situations in interproximal radiography and how to deal with them. This model exhibits gingival hyperplasia in the upper molar area, which may be an obstacle to film placement. Red wax has been added on this model to simulate such a condition. As the film is inserted and the mouth closes, we see that the obstacle displaces the posterior portion of the packet downward. After the exposure of the film and removal of the packet from the mouth, a check of the bite wing shows an oblique distortion with respect to the upper and lower edges of the film. The radiograph shows the result of such a displacement. The occlusal line of the teeth traverses the film diagonally. It provides abundant coverage of the lower molars, but severely restricts the coverage of the posterior maxillary segment. Anteriorly, the reverse is true. The remedy, of course, is to place the film lingual to the obstacle and not allow displacement to occur. This diagram outlines the occlusal quadrants of one side of the mouth. The maxillary segment is on the left. The mandibular is on the right. If the upper second bicuspid is not rotated, a line through its cusp tips will serve as a directional guide for the x-ray beam. The beam, so directed, will be suitable to open most contact areas in the maxillary segment. The interproximal area between the first and second molars is different, however, and the beam must be directed along the red line to open this contact. In the mandibular segment, 
The initially established direction is also suitable for the lower interproximal areas, with the exception of the cuspid first by cuspid contact. A supplementary film with an altered beam direction would also be necessary here. Note that the altered beam direction coincides with that used to open the contact between the upper molars. In some cases, then, only one supplementary film may be necessary to remedy both discrepancies. Others may require an extra film for each discrepancy noted, however. In selecting film for adult interproximal radiography, the longer, narrower number three size is usually suitable for the basic survey. For supplementary films, we use the number two size. Supplementary films are used whenever and wherever necessary. In the model we used earlier, a line passing through the distal cusp tips of the first molar would serve as a guide to align the X-ray beam for the supplementary film and eliminate the overlap in that area. Now we will demonstrate the same technique with a patient. The X-ray cone, at a vertical angulation of eight degrees downward, is directed through the contact area parallel to the imaginary line passing through the distal cusp tips. The prepared number two packet is inserted and its position carefully maintained as the patient closes. The x-ray cone is carefully lowered until the center of the beam is directed at the wing of the film packet. With all alignments checked, the lips are closed and the film is exposed. The x-ray cone is then moved away and the packet is removed from the mouth. It may be necessary to have another supplementary film for the lower cuspid, first bicuspid contact. In this case, the beam is aligned in the same direction that the eye looks through the interproximal contact area. The number two film packet is inserted and positioned perpendicular to the direction of the beam, and the patient closes slowly and carefully. The cone is carefully positioned, the alignment checked, lips closed, and the exposure taken. The x-ray cone is then taken away and the film removed in the usual manner. The following sequence will show several examples of supplementary radiographs and their value in opening up contact areas that are overlapped in the initial interproximal surveys. In this case, the left initial survey was made with the beam aligned along the cusp tip line of the upper second bicuspid, and all proximal surfaces were well visualized except for the lower molar contact. In the supplementary film, the overlap was eliminated. On the right side, an overlap was present between the lower cuspid and first bicuspid, and was corrected with a supplementary film. The other contacts in this view are, of course, badly overlapped. In this case, the initial survey of the right side was suitable for all the maxillary contact areas. It likewise was suitable for the lower interproximals, with the exception of the cuspid first bicuspid contact. The supplementary film opened up that contact quite nicely. This interproximal survey film is properly done. The occlusal plane is horizontal on the film and the upper second bicuspid tips are well aligned. All of the maxillary interproximal areas are well visualized. The lower molar contact, however, is overlapped. The remaining mandibular contacts are nicely open. Again, a supplementary film is used to demonstrate the overlapped lower molar contact. In so doing, note that we overlap the upper molar contact. In this example, the interproximal surfaces of the first and second maxillary molars are overlapped. 
A supplementary film eliminates the overlap. The last example is somewhat more complicated. The lower second bicuspid is sufficiently malpositioned so that overlaps occur on both of its proximal surfaces. Two supplementary films are required for this situation. The first opens up the distal contact area, and the other provides visualization of the mesial interproximal area. Supplementary films must be used wherever and whenever necessary.